Awesome. Okay, I'm actually going to start us because we are in the center and attentive, and I love it. Um, ladies, I am so glad you're here. And I can say on behalf of our leadership team, we are all so glad that you're here. If we have not met before, my name is Allison Treadaway, and I just serve on our leadership team here with Sisterhood. I'm going to start us off with a handful of housekeeping items, and then Monica Odell will come up and share a little bit of the what and the why of what we're studying. And so first things first, some housekeeping stuff. Why we do what we do. Sisterhood study exists to connect women like you to one another as we deepen our faith by studying God's word. We trust and fully believe Isaiah 55 11 that says his word does not return void. It goes out and accomplishes what it desires. So we believe when we gather women in a room and they discuss and they read and they learn and they share about God's word, it's going to change you. It's going to impact you. And so we do this intentionally. Also, um, something we've learned along the way, and I'm sure you've learned in your, your life, is that the more you put in, the more you get out, right? Is that not a lesson we've all learned in life? And so you'll notice here in a little bit, Monica's going to walk us through our workbook. You'll see that there is a daily assignment five days of each week. And so we really encourage you to follow that pattern. It's intentional. Follow that pattern. The more you put in, the more you will get out. But here's the deal. We know life happens. And the last thing we want is for you to not come one week because you didn't finish a day or you never even started it. So here's the deal. The more you get in, the more you'll get out, but come regardless of what you completed that week because merely sitting around a table and hearing from other women is also going to deepen your faith. So come regardless. Another thing we want to make sure you're aware of, we are intentional about discussing before teaching. And so the model of today where you came in and you sat at your tables and you visited with them and discussed things, that will be the plan every week. You will come in, grab some snacks and beverages we'll have provided, sit at your table, and you'll discuss that week's lesson. Your table hostess and co-hostess will guide you through that discussion, and then we'll break like this, come to the middle of the room for a time of teaching. That teaching will not be an overview. We're not going to repeat what you've studied and you've discussed and you've thought about. We're going to dive deeper into one particular aspect of that week's lesson, something that teacher thought stood out to her. She felt like the Lord would have her expound upon. So it will be an additional information, if you will, on what you've studied that week. So we are intentional about that. Also, the last thing we're super intentional about is the folks that are sitting around your table. And so I'm glad you got to meet them. I hope you are going to enjoy them and get learn from each other and get to know them this, sem this semester. Um, those tables, we are very strategic with the assignments. I want to let you know a little behind the scenes of what happens. So when you registered, you probably noticed there was an area, if you are not a member of Harris Creek, you can request sitting with a friend. We will always honor requests of people that are new to Harris Creek or unfamiliar with Harris Creek. We will allow them to sit with anyone they want to because we want it to be inviting and fun for them. And that's so scary sometimes to walk into an environment you've never been in. We always honor those. And then after that, on our registration system, the like, computer registration system, there's this magical little button called auto assign. Uh, we pray over it and then we click it and it takes all the registrants. We do. It takes all of you and it disperses you amongst tables. And then two of us go through and we make sure every table at least has one person at their age, around their age, give or take a couple of years. We don't want you to be alone. Hashtag sisterhood, never standing alone. And so we don't want you to ever feel alone at your table by not having one in your age or stage, but we also really value the multi-generational approach. So much of our lives, we kind of only live around the people of our age and stage, and this is the perfect opportunity for us to learn from one another regardless of age and stage. So we are intentional with those tables. Um, that is the last of my kind of housekeeping announcements. Monica Odell is going to come up now. She's going to give us an overview of what we're teaching or what we're studying and then why we chose what we chose. Thank you, Allison. 
Hi guys, good morning. Gosh, I'm so giddy today. I was like singing at my house and my kids were like, mom, come on. But I was just so happy this morning because it's Bible study day and I get really excited about Bible study day. Um, it's like kind of the first day of school for me and I was the nerd that liked the first day of school. And one of the reasons I really liked it is because I had like my new school supplies. So all of you out there on Bible study day with your new pens and your new highlighters, solidarity, like I get it. All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about my really hopeful prayer for us in this study, why I'm so passionate about it, and what our purpose is in being here. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Gospels and about our workbook. So that's kind of what we're going to do today. It's not a real typical teaching, but we're going to, we're going to make our way through. What is my hope for all of us in this study? My hope really rests in Ephesians 3.19. And my prayer is that we will know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. All the fullness of God. Sometimes we come to Bible study because we want to know more, and that's good. But head knowledge isn't the ultimate reason we're here. It's not the best thing you can get out of a Bible study. When we study God's Word, we get to know the love of God better. And that's the prize. So may this study bring us all into a truer and deeper knowledge of God and his love. Because knowing the love of Christ surpasses any other knowledge. Eve taught us that in the garden, if you were here in the fall, right? Eve chose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of the garden of good and evil. And it was not God. We need to pursue God and his love. But the world does its best to distract us from God's love, or to confuse us and help us along in our disbelief that he could love us. So to grow in our knowledge of his love, it requires some effort on our part. Have you seen how thick the workbook is? Little effort, sorry. <laughs> but for a culture bent on quick and easy answers, that's a hard word. We want to Google something and come away with the answer. We want to just know it. It's a little different um, to Google something than to sit with the same Bible passage for five days. And sometimes we just want to read our verse of the day and move on, or memorize a verse because we can say we did it. Sometimes we go to Bible study so we can socialize with our friends, or we want to check the box on our to-do list because we do it we want, because we want to look like a really good Christian. I've been guilty of some of these things, so it's real for me. A lot of us in this room, though, we have a lot of head knowledge. We know the stories. We know the people. But that's not all there is to this Bible study thing. And I'm really glad about that. Because even the devil knows the Bible. He knows it better than any of us. He's not ignorant. But he's not a Christian. He doesn't follow Jesus. He rejects the truth of God and his love. So that's why I hope that we would pursue Christ more than head knowledge. And it's personal to me because it's part of my testimony. As a young teen, think late 80s, early 90s, I'm a little old, um, my family was involved in a religious organization and they talked of God the Father. They claimed to be a Christian group and we memorized the Bible and we prayed in the spirit, they said. But they taught that Jesus is not divine. That's very wrong teaching, by the way. But they convinced us that the Bible supported their interpretation. They used Greek words and theological terms. They explained away passages that didn't fit with their ideology. And they missed who Jesus is. They made Jesus small. I made Jesus small. And when you minimize or do away with the power of a savior, you have to save yourself. And I observed three main ways that people went about trying to save themselves. First, you have to know it all and do it all and be perfect, and your pride in what you know comes to define you. Or you sin anyway, and you justify it, and you abuse the grace of God. 
or you give up because it's too hard and you abandon God altogether. None of this is the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, the people associated with that organization, myself included, we stunk of pride and of fear, and it was all laced with shame and exhaustion. It was like I was treading water trying to stay afloat, and people kept putting bricks on my shoulders. And I thought I was modeling being a good Christian. But I was really just using every ounce of energy to stay afloat. Because no one can measure up to perfect standards. It's impossible to save yourself. And there is no peace there where you have separated yourself from Jesus. I know. I did it. We tried to muster love in our own strength. So it was so far from perfect. And people got hurt. When I was about 15, God very graciously saved my family from that wrong and dangerous thinking. And I'm standing here today, I'm like proof that Jesus is a good shepherd who comes and he leaves the 99 and he finds the one who is lost because I wasn't looking for him. I didn't even know where I was. And he came for me. My kids at this point would all go, ah. Because I'm like, I'm just a sheep, y'all. I'll say that sometimes. Because I am, and he saved me. And I'll never forget the moment when Jesus helped me see who he really is after the whispered prayer from my mom. Those whispered prayers are so powerful, mamas. And Jesus forgave me despite what I'd said and believed and taught about him that was wrong. And I'm still kind of tender when it comes to my good and kind Lord, if you have not noticed that about me. I love him so much. God's had to forgive me for a lot in my life. So I'm so humbled that he would let me stand here today and say, ah, Jesus is divine. He is the son of God. He is our savior. He is our intercessor. He is our good shepherd. He is the prince of peace. He is set apart and holy. There is none like him. We cannot overstate the glory of God, the power of Christ. It's impossible to overstate. He has it all, all the glory, all the power, all the love. And to know Jesus Christ is to know God. And if you wonder who God really is, if you're curious about who God is, get to know Jesus. Bible teacher and poet Jackie Hill Perry talks about this in her book, Holier Than Thou. And she's explaining John 18, 1, 18, and it says, No one has seen God the Father except through Jesus Christ the Son has made him known. That made him known in that verse means to explains or declared. It's basically saying Jesus explains or declares God. And Perry says, If God were a sermon... Jesus would be the only one qualified to exposit it. God defines God. Colossians and Hebrews tell us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God and the exact imprint of his nature. Michael Reeves is a scholar of the Trinity and a president at a seminary, I think. And he says, our definition of God must be built on the Son who reveals him. But as Ephesians tells us, it's not just enough to know who he is. God wants us to comprehend his love, his heart, his essence. Knowing Jesus, which runs deeper than just knowing about him, it changes us. It transforms us. I'm not the same kid I was back when I was 13 and 14, so confused about God. And the more desperate we know about Christ, the more we know Christ, the more desperate for him we become. The more I've known Christ, the more desperate for him I've become. I need him. I'm the little sheep, right? I know it. I know what a good shepherd he is. I can't survive without him. And a lot of the women we're going to study in this book, this tiny little book, they were desperate for Jesus. And I hope that maybe some of you will find or see some of yourselves and some of their stories. And God will get to teach you how he will respond to you 
when like them, you're hurt or sick or chronically ill, when we're mad or frustrated, when we are tired of waiting, when we're grieving, when we're lonely, when we're poor, when people shame or belittle us, what, is, what does God think about women? Are we strong? Are we smart to him? Are we people who can learn and serve and minister? Are we significant in his kingdom? How did Jesus treat his mom? You can learn a lot about a guy by the way he treats his mom. Who is this God we serve and follow? Will he disappoint me? Or will he exceed my expectations? So this spring, our title is Women of the Gospels, but we are really studying Jesus. Like, we're kind of tricky. You're studying Jesus. And we're not just looking at what he did, but at who he is. Because knowing the Bible is not enough to be a Christian. I knew the Bible. But to be a Christian, you have to know Jesus. You have to believe in him. Trust in his love. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, thank you so much for coming. I talk a lot about him. I'm laying all my cards out for you to see. There's no hidden agenda here. Jesus is the center of everything we do in sisterhood. And if you don't know him or if you're confused by anything I've said, please come talk to me after this. I would love to listen to you and have a conversation with you. He's my favorite thing to talk about, but I'll also listen <laughs> But again, my prayer for this study is that we would walk away rooted, grounded, and transformed by the knowledge of the love of Christ and filled with the fullness of God. I'm supposed to be like talking about the workbook. So we're going to move on. I could talk about Jesus all day. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, the Gospels and about our workbook now. So what does Gospel mean? Gospel basically means good news. And the first four books of the, Old Te- of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those are referred to as the Gospels because those books talk about Jesus when he walked the earth. They give accounts of what Jesus did while he was on the earth to, and what he did to save humanity. They're not really biographies. They're more like a theological essay. They were intended to persuade people to follow Jesus. And there are several different Gospels, but there were also a lot of different audiences they were trying to persuade in the early church. You had the Jewish people who were God's chosen people from the Old Testament, and they'd been waiting for a Messiah from way back at the beginning of time. And so they had to convince the Jewish people that Jesus was the Messiah they'd been waiting for. You have the Gentile people, and they were not the Jewish people, so you had Jews and Gentiles. They were just two groups. But they were included in the salvation. So you had to convince them that Jesus came for them too. But then there were just a lot of marginalized people who didn't really feel like they belonged anywhere in the early church culture. You had women who had little to no power politically or legally. You had people with disabilities, people who were considered unclean. They couldn't even go to the temple, and you're telling them Jesus came to save them. People of different ethnicities from different cultures and countries, poor and rich and powerful and powerless. And these four Gospels teach us that the good news is for everyone who believes in Jesus. They give us a snapshot of Jesus' life on earth and what he did to save everyone. So before I get into more about the Gospels, I'm going to take a little break because yesterday was Valentine's Day. And I'm going to tell you a story that shows how cheesy I am. It might make your eyes roll, but that's okay. I give you permission. But sometimes... Uh, I leave little love notes on my husband's car at work. And I'll say things like, you have a nice smile, but I sign it, heart, your admirer. I know, I'm really cheesy. But I also like to think I'm very cute and adorable. But he, he will take these notes, I've noticed, and he just leaves them stuck on his dashboard. And the reason he keeps these notes is because they're from me. I'm not as you know, anonymous as I think I am, right? It would be weird if he kept them if he didn't know I wrote them. That would be creepy, right? Who writes something makes a difference. So a lot of scholars have spent a lot of time trying to figure out who wrote the Gospels because knowing who wrote them adds to their credibility. It helps us know if they're believable. It helps us understand who the audience might be. 
All scripture is inspired by God, but he allowed us to be part of the process for a reason. So most scholars believe that the Gospels were written in the first generation after Jesus died on the cross, which was around 32 or 33 AD. So most of the Gospels were written probably between 50 AD and 90 AD. Mark was probably written first. There's a little discrepancy on all of this because they're really, really old. But I'm going with the most scholars. Mark, then Matthew, then Luke, and then John was written last. And Mark was likely written by a man named John Mark. And John Mark knew both Peter and Paul. And Peter and Paul directly knew Jesus, right? And we know this because later in the New Testament, you have like, Peter goes to John Mark's house, and then John Mark and Paul, like, they get in a fight, but it's okay because they make up later. So they did know each other. It's even in Scripture. And Mark's writings really emphasize suffering because the early Christians suffered for their faith. They were crucified like Christ. Um, Mark's gospel is an encouragement to them to remind them that Jesus understands their sufferings and he shares in them. And he's encouraging them to keep going. Now Matthew, there's little discrepancy on the author of Matthew. Some believe it was written by Matthew who was the disciple who was a tax collector. And there is a lot about money in Matthew. Uh, in Matthew. It's probably more about money in Matthew than the others. But tax collectors were religious outsiders. And so the author of Matthew had to have an intimate knowledge of Jewish history and practices. And you wouldn't expect a tax collector to know the kinds of things Matthew knows. But ultimately, whoever authored it was likely a disciple or was another Matthew who knew the disciples. And it's a gospel that emphasizes how Jesus is with us. He is Emmanuel. And it reads like a handbook for discipleship with a lot of detail showing how Jesus fulfills the prophecy of being the Messiah. It teaches readers how to follow Christ. Luke is really interesting to me. Um, Luke was written by a converted Gentile who was also a doctor. And they think the author of Luke was also the author of Acts. Those are the only two books in the Bible that have legitimate, specific medical terminology when they talk about different issues related to the body. So we know a lot of actual medical details about what happens with some of these healings and when Jesus is on the cross because of how Luke recorded those events. He saw it through the lens of a doctor. Um, We know that he was really good friends with Paul. And in Colossians 4.14, Paul actually writes, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. So we know that Luke and Paul ministered and traveled together. Um, But Luke also emphasizes how Jesus came for the marginalized and oppressed populations of his time, of all time. There are more accounts of women in Luke than in any other gospel. Luke really wants readers to grasp that Jesus was fully human and fully God, and he came to save us all. And as a Gentile, that makes sense, right? He was on the outside. John was probably written last, and some say it was written by John, the son of Zebedee. It's, it's pretty confirmed that that's probably who wrote it, but they don't know if he wrote it himself or if he dictated it to somebody else to write it for him. But John makes the case that Jesus is divine. It begins, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Like, he's very theological. He wants people to understand that Jesus did walk the earth, but he is divine. And I know that's a very important message. I learned that as a kid. It's a theological essay that's intended to prove that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. And he, we know that because he actually says it in his text. Okay, so these four Gospels, they work together to give us a picture of who Jesus was, the life he lived on earth, and who we are to him. But now, let's get to our beautiful workbook. This book was written by women of our church, for women of our church, and it's full of stories of women who interacted with Jesus when he walked the earth. There's about a dozen or so women in this book. We tried to fit every woman in the Gospels in to seven weeks, but we couldn't, we tried. Um, but it's really a deep dive into how Jesus interacts with women. And every week, like Allison said, there will be five days of study. Please do your best to kind of keep up because there are gonna be two days every week that are just gonna be with you and the Lord. So try to make time for these days. But even though every day is gonna look a little bit different, um, there's gonna be one to three women every week. 
It's written by different people every week. There's going to be some differences week to week. We're still going to do two things consistently throughout the workbook. We're going to utilize the inductive Bible study method and manuscript study. Those are the two ways we're going to study scripture. Inductive Bible study method, and this is all in your introduction of your workbook, so if you don't want to write notes, you don't have to, even though you probably have your new pens, which is awesome. Um, inductive Bible study method is where you observe, interpret, and apply. Observation, what's there? What does it mean? Why does it matter? And um, I have noticed a lot of pushback in myself and in others about the observation phase. And so I just want to encourage you to not skip the observation part. It feels simple. It feels redundant. It feels obvious. We'll ask observation questions and you're like, go deeper with this. Why does it matter what their name is? You know, whatever. But more often than not, when I find some epiphany in scripture or God opens my eyes to some new understanding, it's because I took the time to pay attention to a detail I had never noticed before. So work hard to take time to observe before you rush to the, um, to the um, interpretation and the application. Sometimes it'll be redundant. That's kind of on purpose. The manuscript study is where you actually interact and engage with the text. And a lot of us don't like to write in our Bibles because what if we write a note we don't like next week, right? So we have printed all of the scripture out for you in your workbook. That's why it's so thick. That's really all it is. And you are going to get to interact with that text in a new format, not a way you've always read it before. It'll be new to you and to your eyes. You might see new things, but interact with that text as much as you want. All right. So for two days each week, that's going to be your sole job, manuscript study. It might be days one and day three. We're not exactly sure what the days are every week, but there's going to be a couple of days where you're going to spend time in a passage with you and the Holy Spirit. We believe the Holy Spirit is best equipped to teach you, so we try to give space for him to do that. On two or three days each week, there's going to be some kind of a teaching or devotion of some sort. The writers are basically putting to paper what questions they asked of the text, what things they learned when they were studying it. So they're going to look a little bit different, and that's also kind of on purpose. You're getting a glimpse into how different people study different passages, and we hope you learn something from our processes, even as you figure out how you like to study the Bible the best your way. The last day of each week is a personal reflection by that week's author, where she kind of just tells you her main takeaway from the week. And then there's always going to be space for you to reflect and pray on what you're taking away from that week's study. But before you begin each day, please stop and pray and invite the Holy Spirit to engage with you as you study and learn. We want the workbook to be a helpful tool, but we don't want it to replace whatever work God is doing in you. And if you're new to Bible studies, don't be intimidated. You may be the one at your table with the most to offer because you are the least tainted by pride because of what you already know or influenced by preconceived ideas. Remember, our goal here runs deeper than just gaining more head knowledge about the Bible. We are getting to know Jesus better. <laughs> I am so excited about that, y'all. Okay, so we're going to surrender to the work he wants to do in us. We're going to commit to serving him faithfully. But I'd like to leave you with one last thought. My dear college friend Susan recently reminded me or ta taught me about something she'd read about minutes and moments. If minutes is the time you spend putting on snow gear, the moment could be building the snowman, right? If minutes is changing dirty diapers in the middle of the night, the moment could be when you see your baby's first smile or first steps. If minutes are the hours you spend lesson planning and sitting around a small group table with students, the moment could be when you see a student get it and you remember that. I bet any teachers in here can remember a moment when they saw a student get it. Because we remember moments, but they rarely come without the investment of minutes. We're going to spend a lot of minutes working through this workbook. A lot of minutes. And it will require patience and discipline and prayer, maybe caffeine. But don't give up. God's going to meet you in however many minutes you can give him. Your pursuit of him is never wasted because he's also pursuing you. 
And as we roll along, I can't wait to hear about the moments that you experience with him. The really fun thing about life is we often never know when a minute will turn into a moment. Like the moment you believe you're forgiven or the moment when you experience a peace that you can't explain or the moment when God's forgiveness is real to you, when you're encouraged deep in your soul, when God's love isn't just something you read, it's something you know. So I'm so excited for us to pursue Christ this spring and grow in our knowledge of his perfect love for us. So I'm gonna close with a prayer from Ephesians 3. God, I pray that we would be rooted and established in you. Out of your glorious riches, Lord, strengthen us with power from your spirit in our inner being so that Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith. Help us to be rooted in your love so that we will have power with all of your people to grasp how high and wide and deep and long your love is, that we would know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. And God, I pray that we would praise you because you are a God who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to your power at work in us. May you be glorified in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Y'all have fun with your new pens and highlighters. You're dismissed. <laughs>